In this lecture, we're going to look at the ways in which African art has changed in the last century and a half, and really look at the, the way in which nation building and nationality has greatly altered and transformed the continent of Africa. Before we get to talk about the modern world, I want to go back in time to talk about a very important kingdom in Africa for which the modern nation of Zimbabwe is named. The kingdom is called the Great Zimbabwe, which was this enormous fortification palace that was built in South Africa in the country now called Zimbabwe. The word Zimbabwe means a house of stone. And this ancient artifact is often mystified people as the people who built it have long since disappeared. It's one of the oldest and largest structures in South Africa. At its peak of population, it said the ruins must have had about 18,000 people. The ruins that survive are built entirely out of stone. There is no mortar. It's all stacked and carved and cut stone piled and cared and put together with great care. The ruins span about 1,800 acres and cover a radius of about 100 to 200 miles. In about 1905, the English archaeologist David Randall McCliver concluded that the ruins were medieval and of exclusively African origin. His findings were confirmed by the English archaeological Gertrude Catton Thompson in 1929. That said, there were a big push against this initial idea that these were of African origin. And there was, as we've known before in South Africa, when we were talking about cave paintings, there was a sort of colonial European racist disbelief that Africans could produce such a monument. And so these competing theories and the colonial governments of Africa have really tainted the site and made it difficult to do careful research to the history of the great Zimbabwe. As I said, we know that it was probably built by Monomotapa, the god king of the Karanga people. It is a mortarless construction. And occasionally we see in different places these um, monuments, uh, such as this eagle uh, made out of serpentine stone with these very powerful legs and its tall, proud neck. This is clearly the sign of some royal presence that was to grace these buildings. There was a hill complex with a very difficult ancient ascent that made it difficult for people to get up there to attack. And there was a sort of a giant valley complex where we see many people have lived and, and many farms and places for pastures were there. Inside the great enclosure, we're not quite sure about the function of the different parts, but there was um, clearly a royal compound and there were traded items from China and from other faraway countries that were engaged in trade with the people of the Great Zimbabwe. Here you see a picture of the hill complex overlooking the stone structure, and it is a place, as I said, of kind of uh, meandering pathways and narrow, easily defensible fortifications up at the top. Here is the actual main enclosure. You can see this incredible complex of stone formations that make up the walls and interior spaces of the great enclosure. And so we have a, really a clear idea of how this was used, uh, what parts um, played what function, but it does have and bear a, a common uh, similarity to the structure of villages. And so we believe it's probably based on a kind of royal compound uh, with royal family and counselors and advisors inside the interior. We see a, a whole range of development in the construction of this monument. There is this 
fascinating conical tower, which is solid stone, uh, which, again, we're not quite sure its purpose or function. It's possibly a kind of lookout tower. And there's also, we can see, as the walls grew taller and more precise and demanding, more artistic touches were added, such as at the top you see this chevron pattern, which is a kind of classic Afri traditional African design element that you'll see in a lot of clothing and other artifacts from this area. So the Great Zimbabwe was this huge civilization that flourished for a great deal of time and then vanished. Um, the reasons for its disappearance that people have speculated is that the kingdom had kind of exhausted the natural resources in the area and it was no longer able to trade as effectively uh, with the people around it. And with that, the buildup, there became this sort of long dispersion of the peoples who lived here. Colonial Africa is a distinctly different period of time than the slave trade, the Atlantic slave trade that came earlier. Colonial Africa was a part of a larger program where European countries were seeking ways to sort of monopolize their markets. And they would come in and they would exact a huge price for their goods and they would leverage these sort of unequal trading agreements. They would also destabilize the existing political structure, sometimes with outright raids and destruction, sometimes through uh, supporting weaker factions and dev divisive factions within the kingdom. And so this whole troubled history uh, has had a huge impact on the creation of the modern continent of Africa. To this day, the borders that were arbitrarily carved up in Africa have uh, uh, been maintained by the modern nation states of the African people. And many of those borders had cut across and deliberately divided traditional peoples and grouped together people who were um, traditionally very hostile to each other. And so in this sort of odd patchwork, which is now the African continent, we can see through this map all the different countries that were engaged in this sort of cutting up and carving up of Africa. It begins with uh, the Belgian Congo, which is right in the very center of Africa, this large jungle area which was rich in rubber plants and rubber trees. And, of course, at this point, rubber suddenly becomes a very valuable resource. And it was Belgium that had basically cornered the market on this vast, vast area of Africa. And they were able to use their new weapons of machine guns, Gatling guns, to be more precise, steam engines and such to haul out the wealth from the center of Africa, carve out this huge thing. And because it was so remote, it was very difficult for people to actually know what was going on in the interior. The Belgian king, Leopold II, insisted that this was a humanitarian project, that they were giving civilization and government to people who had none. But as we begin to learn, and, and historical records have, have definitively shown, this was a brutal pillaging and destruction of the civilizations and the people who lived in this area. By 1884, the wealth of Belgium, uh, because of its land uh, grab in Africa, became apparent to other areas in Europe and Britain, Portugal, France, and Germany all jumped on to try and carve out their own part of Africa. And then uh, a little later, Italy would try to make its way into the mix. The story of the Belgian Congo abuses are vividly described in Adam Hothschild's book, King Leopold's Ghost. They believe that through the brutality of this colonial enterprise, half of the population would die 
between 8 to 10 million people. Uh, many others would be mutilated or tortured during this time as a way of exacting an incredible price um, to get the rubber out of Africa. And it's a, it's a heartbreaking story I highly, highly recommend you look into if you're curious about the history of colonialism in Africa. Among the nations who were engaged in the colonial enterprise, very often they would engage in what's called an indirect rule. And this changed depending on how people interpreted this. But basically, there just weren't enough Europeans to effectively rule over the population that they claimed. And so what they would often do was they would inculcate or bring on board certain leaders whom they would pay generously to keep everybody in line. And so for the British, they were very keen on keeping very much hands off and just extracting the wealth as efficiently as possible and using local rulers and paying local rulers to do all their business for them. The French found uh, that they wanted to make people French. They thought they wanted to bring in French culture and they wanted to sort of introduce these leaders to French civilization. So they often brought them to Paris where they would study at the university and then sort of build a French government in Africa, sort of impose French ideas and French values in a very direct way. Whereas the British were more likely to accept on generous terms the traditional ways of doing things. Not always. The British also would interpose their own values, especially when it would come to things like tra traditional or tribal warfare. The British were pretty effective in stamping out tribal warfare in their time. So here we see uh, in this artwork a uh, depiction of a British officer on tour of indirect rulers, and this way in which the Europeans and their pith helmets would kind of avoid, venture into the interior of Africa and try and kind of set up a way to get the wealth from Africa and trade in kind uh, cheaper valued materials, the kind of mass produced materials that Europe was so good at making, but had very little people to sell to, actually. During this time, a very interesting development took place as European culture gets infiltrated into African culture, and Africans go to Europe and experience Europe. They come away with an, a, a deep understanding of Africa's place in the world and especially the unique cultural traditions of Africa and what Africa should be able to contribute to the world. Perhaps most famously um, was the writer, uh, poet, and one time president of Senegal, Leopold Senghor, who was greatly inspired by the Harlem Renaissance in um, Harlem, New York, by the idea of trying to create an artistic movement that would speak to an idea of a pan-African aesthetic, uh, you know, try and break through all these colonial barriers and create a larger pan-African idea. And you can see this in his ideas where he says things like, I wear European clothing, and the Americans dance to jazz, which derives from our African rhythms. Civilization in the 20th century is universal. No people can get along without others. And I tell you, when I went to go see that movie, Black Panther, I was thinking very strongly of Leopold Singer and the, some of the very key, key ideas about that movie that were expressed by him and his desire to create pan-African, a kind of United States of Africa was what he was really after. So World War II really brought to the fore a crisis among European countries um, and a kind of challenge to their ability to maintain these colonial empires. And many of the people who helped support Europe 
deliberately laying down their own lives and joining the armies of Europe to fight against fascism with the expectation that this service would render them free at the end of this war. And it was initially a struggle. But as you can tell from here, following the end of World War II, country after country begins to find a uh, Guinea, 1958. We have a number of over in West Africa, Ghana, 1957, was one of the first to gain independence. And then slowly through the 1960s and 70s, many countries gained independence. Some were very late. Some took quite a very long time to finally gain independence. South Africa, uh, 1961. But even then, as South Africa gains its independence in 1961, it is still under white rule. It is still under the government of, of the the Dutch uh, Afrikaans. Very few countries were able to maintain and keep their independence throughout. The one or two exceptions, Liberia on the uh, far western coast, Liberia was a kind of protectorate of the Americas, and Ethiopia, which had fought a war and successfully defended itself against the invasion of the Italians. And so this is a kind of an interesting part of the legacy here is this is growing independence. Leopold Senghor, he becomes president of Senegal, which is the country, a small country, on the very far western uh, edge of Africa. You can see it there kind of enwrapping uh, the Gambia, just south of Mauritania. And as Leopold Senghor became president, he... Uh, they embarked on a lot of diplomatic missions, one to try and forge alliances and ties between different nations in Africa, and further to try and explore this idea of a new cultural uh, commonality among all African nations. And this he called negritude. And he believed this was a kind of a cultural heritage, values and the spirit of Negro African civilization. He wanted it to be confirmation of being, like the movement of the Harlem Renaissance in America in the 1920s and 30s. He wanted to create positive, powerful images of Africans, that they should be proud of their culture, and that they should celebrate their contribution to the world culture through Things like jazz, which they felt were uh, an evolution of traditional African musics, and cubism, which was an outgrowth uh, and inspired by, in large part, African traditional designs and patterns. So to create this new negritude art, he had competitions and he invited people to explore some of these ideas about this kind of pan-Africanism. Here is a painting, uh, Oil on Canvas, by Bobaka Kualibali, a meeting of the masks from 1976. You can see in it uh, a very clear sort of graphic uh, representation, a patterning and design, which is something like a traditional mask, but it's not actually any particular tradition or anything. It's just sort of a colorful design. And of course, it's an oil on canvas painting. And oil paint is just notoriously difficult to do in the tropics because it just takes forever to dry. So the initial artists who worked in negritude, they uh, would begin, they were trained in Europe, and they would try and employ the, the medium of European arts to express their ideas. But very soon they would find other ways of trying to explore and expand their ideas in different visual media. Here's another example of a negritude style painting by Papa Ibratal called Cosmic Vigil. Again, mask-like, but more organic shapes, trees, tree-like forms, roots, branches, waves, 
And here is Leopold Singer again. It was a question of creating for myself an artistic language that belonged to Africa and Senegal. So there was a desire in these paintings by Papa Ibratal to, to find a kind of commonality, a search for ways in which they could look past uh, historic divisions and cultural differences. And I think it's important to know that was done with a great sincerity of intent, but also with a certain sense of we're inventing culture here, that this is not actually anything that really exists or really represents what's actually going on in Africa today. Here's a, another example uh, by Badara Kamara called Invitation. And here you can kind of see a more playful approach figures, a man, a woman, colorful purples and blues and oranges make this, you know, kind of vibrant and give it a kind of cubist-like flatness. And here you see on the right an example of a cubist painting by Picasso. And so you can see they're very clearly using the kind of means of representation that Picasso developed from African art, and they're taking it back and trying to reinvest it with their own values and ideas. Some of them can be quite playful and, frankly, a little absurd. This is Amadou Sek Samba Guidali, and it's paint in mixed media. Uh, Sek was known to put sand in his paint to give it this more earthy feel. Again, this is part of experiment, to try and create a different kind of painting not just trying to create something that was necessarily a European medium, but what could they do that would make it somehow more African? Here is probably one of my least favorite of the Negritude style art. We could sort of say it's by Mande Muntu. You can see the synthetic Cubist forms been drawn from Picasso's Cubism. There's no specific reference to cultural identity in any particular way. There's an idealization of rural tribal life. There's no representation of cities or modern conditions or modern life. And there are a lot of sort of representations of this idea of spirits and ghosts and this idea of a primitive spirituality. You can see in Mande Muntu, Mande Muntu, there's a kind of the figure is generic and attenuated, and there are these sort of colorful, vibrant, interlocking forms to create this kind of rhythmic, pulsing, jazzy, exciting painting. And there's also a very strong attempt to create some kind of political message. And here you can see another of Modemutu's paintings where clearly the political message is sort of put in a way that it can't possibly be communicated through a pain. The title of this work is Using Mother's Milk to Cure Conjunctivitis. So I'm looking at this picture and I just don't see it. I see, I see a lot of sort of arty, abstract forms, but really I think there is a kind of desire to make art do more than it actually can in this way. Perhaps more successfully is Chimo Buramo, who wrote did a, this picture here on polygamy, which is a real problem in Africa, the tension between a man who has multiple wives, the tension between the wives, and we can see in this painting, a uh, very interesting blending of colors and beads and a kind of an intensity. It's, again, sort of overwrought and overdone, but it's, it has a kind of an intensity, and I think it is sincerely trying to communicate something about a real issue in Africa. Uh, another interesting artist, uh, Christian Lantier, uh, who in, also in, from Senegal, uh, who took place in the first international festival of black arts in 1966. He 
uh, contributed this uh, rather strange looking wire sculpture wound with twine to create a kind of textured uh, sculptural forms in its playful, surrealist quality. And he calls his piece The Chicken Thief, or The Victory of Samothrace. And in this case here, his rather silly sculpture is given a dual identity. And I find it really f funny that he chooses these two ideas to bring together in his, his art. The chicken thief, of course, something sort of village, something very uh, immediate and part of fabric of uh, village life. And then this this idea of the victory of Samothrace, which, if you're not familiar, is this very famous, exquisitely beautiful statue in the Louvre, which is framed as one of the greatest creations of statuary in the Western world. And so he he sort of jokingly couches his art in this sort of impossible duality. That is, it's something just sort of commonplace and village, or is it something of great magnificent art? And I think that duality is part of the problem of the whole program of creating an international festival of black arts, that it, it's trying to reach for a grandiose presence when, in fact, there are so many important real-life things that are here and now and a part of village life that are really important and will not be addressed in that forum. So Christian Latte did a lot of these kind of playful, crazy, wire bent sculptures. I find them really engaging and interesting in a dynamic, surreal way. And it's sort of a really novel use of materials and also a very expressive and dynamic way of creating a new and original form that doesn't feel derived from the Cubist tradition, but is really an expression of crazy, mixed-up world that is now Africa.